Hello, Bible readers. As we enter the final four chapters of Revelation, this post will get into the first parts of chapter 19. If you were to outline the entire letter that we call Revelation, you'd have three major sections. The first three chapters that end with the messages to the seven churches, and then chapters 4 to 18, which could be called God Judges the Great City. And now these last four chapters are God redeems the holy city. I say you could outline it this way because Dr. Eugene Boring did outline it this way in his uh, commentary for the interpretation series, which I'm using quite a bit. So, so that would be a good outline to do if you were to do it. Each section begins with a scene of glory of God from which proceeds a sevenfold vision. So that's consistent with each part. Part one, you might remember, had seven messages for the churches. Part two had a vision of the throne room, which led to sevenfold visions of the last plagues or woes. In this part three, the visions are not numbered like they were elsewhere, but there are seven visions of the second coming of Jesus, the last battle, the binding of Satan, a millennium, the defeat of Gog and Magog, the last judgment, and a new Jerusalem. So just like the second section begins with the words after this, chapter 19 also begins with the worship of 24 elders, a heavenly voice, and the throne that all comes after this. So yeah, this is a new act in the ongoing drama, but there is certainly continuity with the rest of the letter. It's not like Anybody thinks this is an add-on or anything like that. So, for these first 10 verses, did you know that if you cataloged every use of the word hallelujah in the Bible, you would have to list it a total of four times, just four. Verses 1, 3, 4, and 6 of chapter 19 in Revelation are the only place, in places where the word alleluia appears. It is a worship word, meaning praise the Lord, salvation to our God. Boring says it's like, hail to thee, or thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. It functions like that. But here's an important point, too. As much as the heavenly places are worshiping God for defeating the arrogance of earthly empire, it's not as though God had ever abdicated God's kingship or lost God's throne. Boring says usurpers had falsely operated in this world as though they were in charge. So what the community of heaven is celebrating is that God's reign has now become actual and concrete. As Babylon falls and false gods are exposed, the whole of creation can rejoice. Rome and the world had made judgments against Christians. Uh, the world, Rome had excluded Christians in significant ways. But this was much like a fake court who had made an empty ruling based on rules that don't actually exist. And imagine all of that being exposed by God who comes in and says, no, 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 no. I'm in charge here. These Christians you have found guilty, they're free. These ones you have killed, they're resurrected. All that Rome valued, no, 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 no. God's values reign now. That would be worth a celebration, right? That's what's happening in this letter. Have you ever wondered what worship is for? Who it is for? I've asked that question a number of times over the course of my ministry, and I usually get answers like, well, you know, what is worship for? Well, I want to get something out of worship. Or when I ask someone maybe why they stopped worshiping, I just wasn't getting anything out of it anymore. Or maybe it's this idea that I need to fill my spiritual tank at worship. So the pastor better have a good message, or the music better entertain me like I prefer, because I don't like the organ, or I don't like praise band, or whatever. This being the only place in the Bible where worship is like seen in heaven, as John hears hallelujahs, chapter 19 becomes central, a really important place for worship creators in the church ever since to kind of use as a primary source for what is worship about.
And at the heart of what Christians do when they worship is this understanding from Revelation 19 that worship is not about celebrating my pious feelings. Whether it takes my soul to a mountaintop experience or not is not the point of worship. That kind of thing can happen alone in the woods or when I'm in a group on a boat Wherever or whenever the Spirit wants that kind of thing to happen for me, our worship isn't for us. Worship celebrates the mighty acts of God, that God is the true judge, that God pushes Rome aside and takes God's place on the throne forevermore. Thanks be to God. That's what our worship is for. And it should feel like, because John makes these kinds of images and metaphors, like a bride would feel after a long engagement. I think for us, post-COVID shutdown, I think we can relate to what it felt like to gather with crowds again or long-separated friends or relatives again. It was such a relief, and it brought such release all at once to celebrate those reunions, that community, that kind of intimacy. That is what worship is supposed to be. I also want to point out one more thing here. In verse 10, John says, he falls at the feet of the angel to worship the angel. Isn't that weird? Like John has been super critical throughout this whole letter of any time anyone worships someone or something other than God alone. And here John is worshiping this angel? Like what's this about? So Boring says, the purpose of this little charade becomes immediately clear as the angel says, you must not do that. Worship God. So in some of the churches John is writing to, apparently, people are, and you know, people still do this a little bit, people are exalting their guardian angels a little too much, almost confusing them with Jesus himself. Some early Christians were claiming that they were having experiences through and with angels or spirits that just were not appropriate for people who believed in just one God, known through Jesus alone. So John includes this little moment when he falls down at the feet of this angel to make it clear. Angels are, as the angel says, fellow servants with you. So worship God, the angel says, not me, the angel. See, John is throughout this letter offering these little moments to teach the churches in Asia. Okay, so let me get into at least the toward the first of the seven visions of the end. So these first 10 verses of chapter 19 are a hallelujah prelude, you could say. Now we get into seven scenes that describe the end of history. But here's the thing, they are not meant to be in some kind of chronological order. That's news to a lot of people. Some of these images, these pictures, obviously overlap. Some stand on their own. They're just like other. Boring says, we should not strain the text or ourselves to discover some consistent pattern of thought that develops in this series of pictures. Rather, with kaleidoscopic changes of metaphor. I love that phrase because that's what these feel like. It's almost like a kaleidoscope of metaphors and images. Anyway, with kaleidoscopic changes of metaphor, each picture is intended to say something about the character of the end, not just a part of some overall drama. So these seven pictures John makes are not a list of things that are going to happen in order at all. It's more like, as we examine and see and experience these seven pictures, it's more like going through an art show made by John using images from ancient Near East culture and the Old Testament and plenty of other mythological stories where the theme of God's victory at the end is the point that they all share. Each picture is complete in and of itself. And that means, much like when I'm at an art gallery, Some pictures speak to me more clearly or more to my preference than others. And that's going to happen in Revelation 2. Parousia is the first of the seven images or paintings that we'll see. That's verses 11 to 16. And parousia is just a fancy way of saying 
the second coming of Jesus. So I'm going to get into that next time. I am one with my God. My God is with us, all of us, at all times and in all places.